Hi, everybody. I'm Ryan. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, who am I? I'm a cloud developer advocate at Microsoft, um, and my day today is full of all things Rust. Um, and today, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about the Rust programming language um, and what it is, how to do it, and we're going to go a little bit beyond Hello World. Um, so. I'm going to assume a little bit that you know what Rust is and what it's all about, but feel free to ask any and all questions surrounding that. Um, but we're going to blow past uh, what Rust is kind of at a high level and uh, why why is there another programming language named Rust. Um, and we're going to dive right into the code. And, and by the end of the hour and a half or so that we have together today, hopefully we have a little bit of an application um, written in Rust that works together. Um, so I'm going to pop on over to this view here, and hopefully everybody can see that fine. And we're gonna be talking about Rust. Uh, so of course you wanna have it installed on your machine. Um, the best way to do that is to go up to rustup.rs, uh, which is where you can get Rustup. Uh, and Rustup um, is, Rust up is a, a program for managing your Rust tool chain. So there are various versions of the compiler. Um, there are different uh, tool chains that you can use. There are different kind of core tooling that you can use. And Rust up um, is a great way uh, to manage all of that. Um, you can think of it as if you're coming from the node world, like an NVM or something like that, um, where it's managing all of your, your different versions of, of Rust. Um, as far as what code editor uh, you should use, you really can use anything. Um, the thing that I use that works really well for me is VS Code um, with the Rust Analyzer uh, plugin. Um, so if you uh, install VS Code and install the Rust Analyzer plugin uh, extension for VS Code, then you should be on your way. But Rust, it should be fine to use whatever you want, Emacs, Vim, um, you know, Sublime, uh, Atom, I can keep on aiming them all. Um, that anything should be really, um, you know, should be usable with Rust. Um, so without further ado, uh, I think we should just go ahead and get started and start uh, writing a little bit of code. Hopefully that sounds good to everybody. So I'm just going to hide that real quick. And uh, I'm going to be using um, WSL on Windows today. Um, of, of course, uh, you could use it on native Windows if you want to. You can use it on Linux. You can use it on a Mac OS. Um, and everything that we're, we're doing today should be roughly the same. Uh, uh, I don't think we'll actually have anything different between any operating system. Um, but if we do come across that, I'll make sure to give a shout out uh, there. So once you've installed uh, RustUp, you should be able to, to see this here. And RustUp by default installs both the Rust compiler, Rust C, and Cargo, which is the Rust build system for your uh, specific architecture. So if you're running like I am on x86-64 Windows, it will have, um, or Linux in this case, um, it will uh, have that compiler and that Cargo um, build tool installed on your machine. Um, and just to make sure that everything is working fine, you can go in and just type cargo. And as long as you're seeing something like this, Rust package manager here, um, then you should be good to go. And of course, if you have any troubles, um, you know, shout out and chat and we, we'll see if we can get uh, some help for you there. All right. So what are we actually going to be building today? Well, I think the best thing for us to build uh, would be a key value store command line utility. Um, that's gonna really exercise our Rust skills without pushing them too hard and, and should be doable uh, in about mm, an hour and a half that we have. Um, and so what that's going to allow us to do is to get and set um, key value data from the command line where we will be able to type something like, um, if, we t if we call our, uh, our utility KV store, um, we could do something like KV store, you know, hello and world. Uh, like this, and KV store is not found, and then we could do something like KV store hello, and it should return world back to us. So that's just a little kind of key value store utility. Uh, hello, nature hermit there. What did you miss? We're programming some some Rust today, so that's what we're doing, and we're working on going to work on a key value store. That's going to be our little command line utility that we're going to build today. We're just getting started, so you haven't missed too much. All right, so how do we get started with a, um, an actual uh, utility, a binary executable in Rust? Well, we'll go ahead 
and just do cargo new and then the name of the project that we want to do and you know I've decided to call this KV store like this and you'll see that cargo has created a new package for us called KV store and so we can go into our KV store just like this um, and do I have tree I don't have tree installed on here um, if we look uh, at the the actual layout uh, on our file system we have a cargo.toml file that's a kind of a, a a metadata file that describes our package and of course we have a source file um, in here and that just has our main.rs file that's where our code lives and there's really nothing much more than that so um, cargo does a little bit to help us out here but not very much we don't have too much going on here so i'm going to pop this open in vs code And you'll see um, we also have a git ignore file that Cargo has created for us, which is really helpful. And now um, my Rust Analyzer plugin has kind of uh, picked up here and created this cargo.lock file, um, which is a, a dependency lock file um, and a target folder, which con contains all the build um, artifacts that we're creating here. And they're ignored by default. Um, so this is just where our, our end executable will end up in this target file here. But that's not important. The important part is we have hello world in here. So and it looks like Rust, Rust Analyzer is uh, bugging out on me. That's fine. If we look uh, here, um, we simply come with a kind of default um, main function here that just prints hello uh, world to standard output. So just to make sure that things are, are working. And in fact, I'll just do this real quick uh, in here. Um, just going to run cargo and run and that will compile and then run our executable and you can see that it prints hello world uh, to standard output so everything is working here um, cargo run is a really useful tool and there's going to be a couple others that will use cargo build is just going to build the executable not run it and cargo check like this will go ahead and type check but not actually build the executable which saves a little bit of time because generating the code takes um, Take some time. There's a question in chat: Is Cargo part of Rust? Um, so Cargo is is not part of Rust. It is a separate thing from the Rust compiler, but it is a, a tool that is very highly integrated into any Rust programmer's workflow. And I would say 99.99% of Rust uh, developers out there are using Cargo for their for their um, development practices. And, and so really you can think of Cargo as a build tool, a dependency manager, um, and, uh, and a, a kind of a, a project um, bootstrapper. Um, and so it has gone ahead and bootstrapped a, a project for us. But we could have done this on our own if we wanted to. Um, and it does auto-generate this hello world for us just, to, just so that we get started. Um, and we're being asked if we can increase the code size. I'm going to go ahead and do that real quick and then collapse this over here and hopefully that's a little bit better. Let me let me know if that works uh, for you. Um, and if you want to know how to open up the terminal from VS Code um, on, on my machine at least it's just control and tilde opens it up. Um, all right. So uh, without further ado, let's actually start writing some code. So what do we need to do here? Well, the first thing that we need to do is probably parse some command line arguments. Um, remember, again, we want to be able to write something like kv. I'll just blow this up a little bit more. Oh, whoops, sorry. We want to be able to write here kv store hello world to store hello the key hello with the world um, value. In our, in our database that we're going to create. And so, of course, these are some command line arguments. Um, in, if you're used to programming C, for instance, you would expect your main function to take in um, argv and argc, that we don't have that in Rust. Um, instead, what we can use is the standard, oh, and I really hope that uh, I don't have to turn off Rust Analyzer. I'm not sure if my latest Rust Analyzer, because I was messing with it, um, Ends up uh, ended up actually breaking something here. We'll we'll see in just a second. Um, yep, we'll have to turn it off. That's unfortunate. That's okay though. Let's go ahead down here, and we can go ahead and just disable this real quick. All right. So we're going to call standard env 
and then arcs. And this will go ahead and get us the an iterator over arguments. And so we're getting we're already getting into iterators in Rust. This is this is already somewhat of an advanced topic, but that's fine because all you have to know about iterators in Rust is it allows it allows you to continually get new values by calling a next function. So you call next on it and it will give you another value. You call next again, it will give you the next value until it doesn't give you any more values. Um, and the values that it's going to give us here are the arguments um, in, on the command line that we want. And so um, if you've done any uh, you know, programming on Unix before, you know that your command line arguments, the first argument is going to be the actual execute, the, the path to the executable itself, um, which we don't really care about. And the great thing about iterators is that they come with all these high level functions that allow us to um, manipulate our, our iteration. And one of them is skip. So we're going to call the skip method on our iterator here. And that allows us to skip one the first element. We're going to skip one element. Um, and then what we can do is uh, just call this args here. So this is going to be our args with the first element skipped. And coming down here again, we can just go ahead and run cargo check. And you'll notice we're getting a warning here saying we're not used using args, but it but it has compiled fine. So we've run cargo check here, and we've everything is running fine. Um, we're getting a warning saying, hey, you're not using args, um, which is true, but that's that's fine. A warning is, is something we'll take care of in just a second. Any questions about this chat? Let me know. Um, this is the basis of, of our program so far. Okay, so now we have the arguments. What do we actually want to do with them? Well, we probably want to go ahead and get our key and our value. Um, and we'll, the way that we can do that real, real easily is by saying, hey, the, the key is going to be the very next thing in our iterator. So our iterator is args, and we can call next on it like this. And just again, just to make sure we're compiling. Oh, we've got an error here. Here's our first interesting uh, error that we have. We're getting an error saying we cannot borrow args as mutable because it's not declared as mutable. And here's a key to learning Rust. If you've not done any Rust programming before, the absolute key is to read the error messages because the error messages in Rust are actually very good. And they'll usually give you the answer to what you need to, to, to do here. And so, help consider changing this to be mutable. So in fact, args, when we're iterating on it, we're actually mutating the iterator because the iterator is keeping track of where we are in the iteration. So we need to actually mutate it. And by default, Rust is completely immutable. So we have to opt into mutation in Rust. That's very different than a lot of other languages that are the opposite, where everything is mutable by default and you opt into immutability. Rust is the opposite. Um, and I, I must say, I find this to be a much better uh, default. Immutability is a very good default to have. So we declare that our args can be mutated. And if we go ahead and check this again, then we still have a, a warning here that we're not using key, but everything has compiled just fine. Um, so uh, there's a question in chat. Does next item, what happens if the next item is null? Um, so that's a very good question. Um, and we can actually uh, check on this. And I'm, I'm a bit sad that my my Rust analyzer is, that I broke my Rust analyzer here. I don't know what happened here, why it's bugging out on me. It's a bit of a shame. Um, I'm wondering if I go ahead. Oops. Just real quick. Um, if I uninstall and reinstall, maybe that uh, maybe that will help here. Let's see here. Oh, seems to seems to have temporarily helped um, because we have some we have some uh, some helpers here. This right here, you see, just showed up. Now this is our this is I didn't write skip args here at all. This is Rust Analyzer showing us the type. That args is so. So Rust is a statically typed language, and that means that everything has a type, uh, and so we can gain some information from the type. There was a question in chat about uh, 
what happens if next is null? Like what happens if uh, when we call next, there is no other argument? Like let's say we pass, uh, we don't pass any arguments uh, to the command line. Well, you'll notice here that the key is an option string. So in Rust, there is no null. Um, everything in Rust, you know, you can't have null in Rust at all. There's no concept. I shouldn't say there's no concept of null. Uh, null is a very advanced concept in Rust that we will not be touching at all today. In general, you don't deal with null at all. You deal with optional values. So if you're coming from a language like Swift, this will be familiar to you, um, or, or Haskell or some uh, functional programming languages. Um, You'll notice here that when we call it next, we get an optional string. So we don't get a string back that might be null. That's, you know, that's not very helpful. We know when we have a string, we have a string. But here, when we call next, we don't know if we have a string because we not, there might not be another command argument. So that's why it's an option here. Um, and this lets us, this forces us to handle the case where we might not actually have uh, the next string. All right, so if we go ahead and uh, let's just say, uh, and Rust Analyzer, I don't know what's going on, why it's, why it's being sad at me. So I'm just gonna go ahead and disable it for now. That's a, that is a pity. All right, so we have next here. I don't know, I, what is going on? I have, oh. Reload was required, sorry for that. Okay, so we've turned off Rust Analyzer again, which is a bit of a shame, but so what about the case where we don't care if there is not another value, we really just wanna like crash the program if it's not there? Well, Rust comes with a nice little shorthand for that, we can just call unwrap here, and unwrap will crash the program if the next value was not, if the value from next was not there, if there was no value, also known as none, and if it is there, then it will return back a string here. So the value we have in here is going to be a string. Otherwise, we've crashed the program. Unwrap is really great if you're just kind of writing a simple program um, and you want you want to get uh, you know you don't care if to handle errors or something like that. You just want to crash the program if something goes wrong. Um, later on, we'll see how to handle these errors more more elegantly than this. Um, and the great thing is now we can do the same thing for our value. So if we go here and say args next unwrap, we now have our value. And we can go ahead and print those out to standard out just to see. Uh, we'll do key here and value is here and key and value print line here you'll you'll notice a bit of a strange syntax of the exclamation point um, that's that means that print line is a macro we won't be talking about macros here but just know print line happens to be a macro and anytime you use a macro uh, it will end in an exclamation point that's just what that means and we can go ahead and run this I'm going to do cargo R which is just short for cargo run um, and you'll see that we have panicked and panic is another way to say that we've crashed the program Well, why have we crashed the program? Well, we said it right here if there is no key We'll crash or if there is no value we'll crash So it's done exactly what we've said I expected it to do um, And in fact, we see on what line it crashed on main three right here So this is the line where it's crashed and that uh, we know exactly why it's crashed here. So we'll have to actually pass some command line arguments to here. Um, there's a question, macros like C++ or like in Lisp? It's more like in Lisp, um, so hygienic macros, if you're familiar with that term. Um, uh, it's not like C and C++ where it's just kind of string copy and paste macros. Um, but we won't, that's probably all we'll talk about macros for today. Um, all right, so let's pass in some key, um, and I think we can just do foo and bar here as our key and our, our value here. And if we run it again, you'll see we've printed out to standard out, key is foo, value is bar. So everything uh, is working as we expect it to. So we have our key, key and value here. Now what we have to do is actually um, save this persistently. And so we're creating a, a key value database here. How do we want to save this? Well, the easiest way to do that is to write our database 
to, to disk, write it out to our file system and save it in a file somewhere. So we're actually going to take our key and our value and save it in a file um, on, on disk. Okay, so how do we do that? Um, well, a good thing for us to do, let me pull this up again. Uh, when we don't know how to do something in Rust is to go over to uh, docs.rs slash standard and, and it redirects. Uh, so I'm going to show that to you again. Um, docs.rs slash standard right here. And docs.rs slash standard uh, redirects to this um, to the standard library documentation for us and the standard uh, library documentation for us just like most documentation in rust is usually qu is quite good because the documentation um tooling is built in with uh with rust you it comes with um rust doc which is a, a great uh documentation tool um and so, of course, if you're completely new to Rust, you might not know where to look. I happen to know that everything um, related to file systems is in this standard FS module, st FS for, for file system. And this will give us a whole bunch of structs and functions and stuff like that that have to do with the file system. Um, and probably what we want to do here, if we're looking through here, um, what do we want to do? We don't really want to uh, to create deer or anything like that. We don't want to, to root. But hey, this looks good. What about right down here? Right, right here says write a slice as the entire contents of a file. We don't really know what a slice is, but this sounds good. This function will create a file if it doesn't exist. This this sounds perfect. And we even have an example down here. Um, where fs write, we write to some file called foo.txt, we write the, um, the text lorem ipsum, um, and we can write you know, several files here. So this sounds, this sounds really great. We probably can, can just use this. Um, and I'll go ahead and get rid of this real quick. So we can say um, standard fs and then write and we'll have to provide a uh, a file path, and you know I think like um, kvdb uh, or kv.db, even better. Um, and then we're going to have to do something like contents here. All right. And of course, you know, if we want to go ahead and try and compile this, we'll notice I don't. It's uh, Rust compiler telling us I don't know what contents is. What What are you talking about there? Um, which makes sense. We don't have this this contents variable, so we should probably go ahead and create that. And we now we have to think. Okay, what do we actually want to store in our database? Well, there's many different ways that we can do them. Do this. Some are more efficient than others, but I think just a simple way to do it is to store it as a string, where the key and the value are separated by a tab character, and every key value pair is separated by a new line. So that means uh, inside of our database file, you know, it's going to be key one, tab, uh, value one, and then new line, key two, tab, value two, and so on and so forth, like that. All right. So our contents are going to be kind of a string with with these things in it, and we need to format that string in a, sp a specific way. And there's another macro for that called format that allows us to format a string. So it's just like it has the same exact syntax as print line, except that instead of printing to standard out, it just creates a string with uh, that's that's formatted in that certain way. So we said we want a key followed by a tab character, followed by uh, the value, followed by the new line. And we can say a key and value like this. And then we should check, did that work? Oh, hey, looks like it did work. All right. So we're getting a warning, a new warning up here that we're going to look at in just a second. But just to make sure that we are you know, doing things correctly here, we can look inside of our kv.db file here. And you'll notice foo. And presumably, you know, that's a, a tab character. If we want to, we can use uh, xxd 
to look at this. This is a, just a, if you're not familiar with XXD, this is a command line utility um, for looking uh, at binary files. Um, and you'll notice here, what is it? Uh, F O O and then zero nine, zero nine. I believe if I'm looking at, oh, this is great. Let me do it over here. Man, ASCII. If we look at ASCII, yes, all right. So nine is a horizontal tab character. So it looks like every, everything is working out as we expect. We've got foo followed by a tab, followed by bar, followed by a new line. Everything seems to be working. All right, so this is all well and good. We did have um, an interesting uh, error message, uh, not sorry, not an error message, a warning here saying unused standard result result that must be used. So Rust is trying to, to help us out here. Rust is trying to tell us that we're using standard FS write, but we're not actually hand, handling the value that gets returned from FS write. And if we go ahead and look here, you'll notice that FS write returns a result, which is this thing. So in Rust, you don't have a uh, you don't have exceptions. Instead, you have result types where you return back either a value that you want or an error type of some type. And here, standard I/O result is simply um, the the normal result type. There is a just a normal result type you can see here, which is just OK or error, where the error type is an I/O error. So we're, we're returning back a result. It's either a value or it's an I/O error. And an I/O error is any error that can happen from um, from an I/O operation. All right, Mr. Halsey, welcome. Coming in and seeing what we're doing here with Russ. Welcome, everybody. So there's a question. Does this mean Rust has no void? Um, so Rust does not have void per se, but you'll notice here inside of uh, the return type for FS write, it's returning this open parentheses, close parentheses here. And that is a, an empty tuple, if you're familiar with a language construct called a tuple. Um, also known as unit, that's what we call it. And if you're coming from a functional programming background, this is going to be super familiar to you. Um, but if you're not, you can basically think of tuple just like void. All it is is simply um, a, a value that represents kind of a nothing, like it's an uninteresting value. Oh, and there was a question about uh, type inference from above. Um, yes, Rust is is fully. Uh, type inferred um, and so you don't usually have to provide types there's sometimes where it can't quite figure it out but of course if it can't figure if it's if it's ambiguous what you mean rust will complain and say you gotta tell me exactly what type so here for instance we know that value here is an option string if we really wanted to be clear about it and let the whole world know that it's an option string we could write it like this so this is where we are telling uh, Russ, this better be an option string or give me um, give me an error here. But you'll find that most of the time Rust programmers just let the the compiler infer um, the the type here. All right, and there's uh, there is a question about what are the main uses benefits of Rust over other languages. Real quick, um, Rust is a is quite a low level language. Today, we're not really seeing that. We're talking about functional programming and option types and stuff like that. And it may seem like we're talking about a high level functional programming language. That's sort of true. Um, but Rust at the end of the day is a systems programming language. So you can think of it as being in the same space as C and C++. That's usually what uh, Rust is used for. The same things that C and C++ are used for. Operating systems, browsers, um, kind of low level systems technology that other uh, other software will run on top of. Um, and we'll get into it a little bit uh, later on in this um, stream, but Rust really cares about what is actually happening in the machine. It only just provides you abstractions above that to where you don't have to worry about it unless there is an ambiguous way to make things more efficient and faster. What that means um, is that Rust offers something called zero cost abstractions. 
That means when you create an abstraction in Rust, just like you would in any other programming language, Rust tries its real hardest to not, um, for that abstraction to be as performant as possible. And if you're not using a uh, abstraction, you shouldn't have to pay for it. Real quick example of, of, of an extraction that you pay for all the time in other languages, think about in uh, a garbage collected language, whether it's C Sharp or whatever, Ruby or Python or whatever. No matter if, you, if your program simply adds two numbers together, you pay the price of having a garbage collector because the garbage collector needs to start up. There's a whole runtime system that starts that is not a zero cost abstraction. Doesn't matter what you do, you're always paying for that abstraction, even if you don't use it. And Rust, normally things don't work that way. Um, Rust can run on bare metal. You can completely remove any runtime dependency, just like C by default Rust on, on Linux will run with, uh, with libc. So there is a little bit of a runtime there, just like C has, but um, that's, that's optional and you can completely remove it. Um, the reason that I'm interested in Rust at Microsoft and the reason that Microsoft in general is really kind of starting to look at Rust and takes Rust very, very serious is uh, its safety properties. Unlike C and C++, Rust is completely memory safe by default, meaning you can't um, run into memory um, issues that you would run into with C and C++. Rust does not have a garbage collector, um, but just like languages with a garbage collector, you don't have to worry about things like use after free, um, double free, all these um, memory safety issues that you run into with, with other languages. Rust is completely memory safe and actually provides more guarantees than, than garbage collected languages when it comes to these things. So hopefully that was a, a quick um, explanation of why Rust is interesting. Just, just remember, um, although Rust seems like a high level language, we'll see um, sometimes that's, you know, we don't get that advantage and we actually have to really care about um, uh, what's happening uh, on the machine. All right. Um, there's a question about uh, Haskell and, and Rust traits. Um, you can think of, of Rust traits um, a lot like Haskell type classes, but we won't uh, get into that. And by the way, if you're not into functional programming at all, don't worry, Rust might be a doorway for you, but most of the time you won't even know that you're you're doing a lot of functional programming. At the end of the day, Rust isn't a functional programming language. It's an imperative programming language, but it takes a lot of influences from functional programming languages. All right, I hope I got everybody's question there. Um, uh, there's a question about constructor destructors. Um, Yes, there are construct. There are not constructors uh, in in Rust, but there are destructors, um, which we won't talk about today, unfortunately. Um, this is being recorded, and I think it will be available on YouTube uh, later on. Um, so if you haven't caught everything, um, you can watch this uh, again. All right. This is awesome. Keep the questions coming. That's really great. Um, so far, uh, we have a working database here, but of course, um, there's a huge bug in it. Um, which hopefully is very easy to spot. And that is every time we run this, no matter what we provide, um, when we come here and run, by the way, real quick, I'm just gonna run cargo build here that remember that builds um, the, uh, the program, but does not run it. If you want to run the binary directly, you can go into target debug and then the name of the program, which is in our case KV store, and then run it like this. So it's just a plain executable. Um, and of course we're crashing here because we're not providing a key and a value. So hello world here. Let me go ahead and we can run, you know, hello world here. And if we look at our kv.db here, hello world is there. But of course, if we write hello Welt, which is the German word for world, I, I'm I live in Germany. Um, you can see when we print it out, we get hello about. So we're we're basically overriding our keys and our values every time. That's not you know the most useful database in the world where we can only keep one key and value at a time. So really, we need to go ahead and um, be able to read in our database, add our keys and our values, and then store that back out. So we can we can keep on going here. Um, you know, inside of our main function, but I think this is a really great time to start abstracting out um, the, the idea of our database. Um, and the way that we're going to do that is by creating a struct called database. 
Now, Rust does, is not an object-oriented language. It doesn't have classes. Um, it has structs very, very similar to, to C um, or to Go. Uh, and so here we have a struct called database. And structs are just kind of um, named uh, co collections of values. Right? Um, and so our database here is going to, to hold on to keys and values. Um, now, what kind of data structure is really great at holding on to keys and values? Um, well, when I think about that, I think about hash maps. Um, and in fact, Rust comes uh, with a hash map uh, type in its standard library. So we're going to store a hash map inside of our database struct. And hash maps are available in standard collections hash map. Now, oh, sorry, can't type. Now, if we if we try to do this um, and actually run it, we'll notice we get a compiler error here saying, "Hey, I expected at least two type arguments in hash map." Now, if we look up here, wrong number of type arguments. Expected at least two, found zero, and that's because Rust has generics. We can't, it's not good enough to say we want a hash map. We have to say a hash map of what kind of keys and what kind of values. We have to provide actual concrete types for the key and the value type that we're storing. And so for us, I think it's best if we just store a string as the key and string as the value. So this is what generics and Rust look like. Our hash map is now, um, is now whole. And the type of key that we have is string, and the type of value that we have is also string. And of course, we didn't have to pick these, but for our particular program, this makes a lot of sense. All right? So structs are all well and good, um, but it makes a lot of sense if we go ahead and add functionality to our struct. Um, and this is where, while I said Rust is not an object-oriented language, um, it does provide some of, some of the fun conveniences of object-oriented languages. Um, without uh, some of the problems. So we can add functionality to our, our uh, struct here by saying, I want to provide an implementation for this, for my type database, and I'm going to add some functions and methods to it. Now, the first thing that we're going to do is add a constructor. Now, I know I said there are no constructors in Rust, but you'll see in just a second what I mean by that. We're, we're creating a function here called new, and it's going to return a database. And this is what functions look like uh, in Rust, very similar to the main function here, except that's inside of our impl here, meaning that it will be kind of attached to this database type. And we can return a database here by saying standard collections hash map new. And you can see here, hash map has a new function as well. And this creates the hash map, just like this new function here creates the database. Now, I said before, like, there are no constructors in Rust, which is true. Like, this is just a function. There's nothing special about it. It constructs a database, and I called it new, but that's completely arbitrary. I could have had the same function called foo or create or whatever I wanted to call it. Um, new is just a convention for functions that create types. Usually you use the function name new, um, but you don't have to. Um, so there aren't constructors in, in Rust in, in the sense of constructors being a special language feature. They There just happens to be a convention for functions that create types being called new. That's all. All right. Hopefully this makes sense to everybody. If it doesn't, um, let me know. Um, so enter is not a keyword right here. Uh, enter is also, in, in Rust, we have structs uh, that have values inside of them. So we can have an, you know another thing like, uh, you know foo is going to be a string here and bar is going to be, um, I'm trying to not uh, introduce too many new types here. Um, U8, an unsigned 8-bit integer. Um, this is simply inner is, I happen to call it inner. Um, if you can think of a better name for it, like, you know, we could call it hash map here. Um, 
that's also fine. It's not a keyword. It's just saying there's a field inside of database um, that we have called enter. That's all. There's a question, is the struct like an interface and you provide its implementation? No, so structs are concrete types. Database, I can tell you a database in memory will be however big, you know, roughly that a hash map uh, is. So probably three, probably th three words big. So what is that, uh, 24 bytes long? I mean, this is getting way ahead of ourselves here, but this is a real concrete type. Struct impl here just means we're adding functionality to it. Um, we could have free functions like this. Um, and the difference is right now, when we want to call this new function, let's say we want to call it up here, we would do this database colon colon new. We've now called that new function. If we remove the impl here, this will no longer work. And we just have to call new as a, as a free function like that. But this is, this is much nicer. Um, the stream will be published later on YouTube, so look out for it there. Um, the the uh, the link was posted above. It's youtube.com slash Microsoft Reactor. All right, so hopefully this makes sense to everybody. Here we are creating a database. We're calling the new function that's associated with that database type. We could have called it anything we wanted to, but by convention in Rust, when we're creating a type, when we're logically creating the type, we usually call that function new, but we can call it whatever we want. And this creates our database here. This is really great. So we have a database here. Um, it has it has empty things inside of it, um, an empty hash map new on, on hash map. Uh, it's just an empty hash map. It has no keys and values inside of it. Um, one thing that I like to do here is we keep repeating the standard colon colon collections colon colon hash map. That's, there, there's so many, you know, that's really long. I would really like to just say hash map instead. The way you can do that is by you saying use standard collections hash map. And this brings that hash map name into scope so that when we call, when we just refer to hash map here, it knows we're referring to standard collections hash map. So this is the same thing. We've now brought standard collections hash map into scope. Um, yes, so we renamed uh, enter to hash map here. So um, I'm going to keep it as enter because that's what I like to do is call it enter. The reason for it is because it's our inner type. I don't know. It's we can we can bike shed names here. Um, I'll, I'll call it enter for now and we can we can decide what we want to call it later on. All right. So we have a database, it's completely empty, but this isn't really what we want, right? We want to create our database and when we're creating it, we want to first read the database file, get all the values uh, from the database file and store that in our hash map so that our hash map contains, the inner hash map contains the keys and the values that were in our database file. So what does that mean? We have to read the database file and we have to uh, store the value, we have to parse the values inside of that file and then store them into the hash map. So let's go ahead and do that. And we can go back to our friend, our friendly documentation over here, standard FS again, and figure out, okay, how do you read an actual file? And there's a bunch of, of ways to read. We can you know, read into a, a read bytes, we can read a whole directory, we can read a link, um, but read to string is probably what we want here. Read to string simply is reads the entire contents of a file as a string. And you'll notice here that it returns a result of a string. So of course, reading from a file can fail. The, the, the file not, might not be there, or there might be some disk error or something like that. Um, so this is important to know. Read to string can fail here. All right, so let's go ahead and do that real quick. We can say contents equals standard fs read to string and now we pass in our um our path here and what was it it was kv.db so the question is what should we do here 
when read to string fails, what do we want to do? Now, before what we were doing is we were calling this unwrap function, which uh, took, uh, we called unwrap on options before um, results are the same thing. If it's if the value is an error, it will crash the program. So this is fine. We can totally do this. We can call unwrap. And if read to string fails, we'll just completely kill the entire program. That really helps for kind of quick programs uh, like we're working on right now. Um, but uh, we, we maybe want to handle this error a bit more elegantly. Um, and the way that we can do that is by saying that instead of our new function here returning a database, this means this, this function will always return a database. Can't error, it might crash, the program might crash, but there won't be, there's no way to handle that crash. Um, if we want errors that we can actually handle, we need to return a result type ourselves. So here we're going to return result of either a database or some error type. Now, error here is something I made up. Um, error doesn't exist. And in fact, if we try and run this now, we'll get an error here saying, I don't know what error is. Can't find the type error. Tell me what error is. And so we need to provide an actual concrete error type. Now, one that we can do is standard IO error, which we've seen before. Standard IO error is right here. And these are any errors that have to do with IO operations. So we're going to do that for now. We're going to return a result where if everything is fine, we get a database back or we return an IO error, an error inside of doing some, some IO. All right. So how do we actually return uh, this error? Well, there's multiple ways that we can do this. Um, one way that we can do it is using pattern matching. So that's what the first thing that we're going to do. We're going to use pattern matching, which if you, again, if you're coming from, uh, if you are, I'm going to make this slightly smaller. Hopefully this is still okay. Let me know chat if, it, if it's too small. If you're coming from uh, uh, functional programming, um, pattern matching will, will be very familiar to you. If you're not, um, you can think of pattern matching as being just like a switch statement from C or, or JavaScript or whatever, but just much better. <laughs> and we'll see how. So we're going to match on what is returned from read to string. And if read to string returns back OK, meaning everything was good, then inside of that OK is going to be our contents. And then once we have those contents, we can do something with them. So we're going to just return them back from this match. Now, this might be surprising to you because you're coming from a language that um, where you have the difference between expressions and statements. And Rust, basically, almost everything is an expression. So we're just returning contents here and assigning it to this outer contents variable here. I'll make that clearer by calling this C and this C. So we're unpacking C from OK and then returning it into this contents variable here. Now, if we go ahead and try and compile this, oops, if we try and compile this here, we'll get another error. Um, we will not get the error that I want it to get. Uh, this is a different error. Let me fix that real quick. We have to return a result from this function. So here you can see once we reach this line, we're going to return OK. Like, Okay, meaning everything's good. And if you want to know what okay actually is, like where is this okay coming from? If we look at this is re the result type that we're we're looking at. We haven't talked about enums quite yet, but w what enums are are um, uh, basically like one. It, it's either one variant of the enum. In this case, okay or it's the other variant of the enum error. So when we talk about a result, we're talking about one of two things. It's either okay, meaning everything's good, or it's an error. And we can match against that result and see, okay, is it, is it okay or is it an error? And do different things depending on which it is. In other words, okay is everything is good. 
So result is a type that represents either a success or a failure. And now if we go ahead and compile this, you will see that in pattern matching, everything needs to be exhaustive. So we've handled the case where everything was okay, but we didn't handle the case where there was an error. And you'll see that the compiler is telling us like, hey, you didn't cover the error case here. You got to cover that. If you don't cover it, I will error at you and we won't even be able to run the program. So what we can do is handle the error case. We get some error like this. And just like with OK, we're binding the actual error type to this name E here. We can, or we can call it error, whatever we want to call it. And then we can do something with that. One thing we might want to do is return back that error out from the function. So we're actually returning the error from the function just like this. So again, what is this doing? We're calling standard fs read to string, which returns back to us a result. And we know a result can either be OK, everything was good, or error. And what match allows us to do is say, which one is it? If it's OK, take the value that was inside of OK and do something with it. Now we could do more than just you know put it back into contents. We can do anything with it here. We, we can have a whole, uh, a whole bunch of code in there but we're just returning this into contents. Or if it's an error, then the thing inside of that er variant, call it error, oh, and this needs to be error, and just return it back out from the function. So by the time that we get here at the end of this line, contents will just contain what it was ever in C. There's a question of, are, is OK and error methods or types? They're not really either. OK and error are variants of the result enum. So another way we could write this um, is like this. So it's either result OK variant or result error variant. And this is really kind of, if you're coming from a, um, a non-functional uh, background, this might be the most kind of mind-blowing thing here. Um, but this is, this is kind of key to, to Rust programming. Now, if you're a very, if you're a low level programmer and wondering what the heck, um, how does this actually, you know, map into to memory? These are just uh, effectively just like tagged unions. Um, so in memory, there is uh, probably usually a byte, let's say, that represents, uh, is it okay? Is it an error? Um, and then there is a, um, a data section attached to that um, that contains um, uh, the data associated with it. The thing that makes this much better than tagged unions in C is that we, if we get okay, we can't read out an error, or if we get an error, we can't read out uh, the the thing inside of the contents inside of okay like it we can't screw this up Rust will not allow us to screw this up and Earl tease me I'm not uh, I'm I'm not going to get into that that's that's a bit too too meta of a point right now but yes you are correct um, okay so this is a very common pattern. This, this com there's a very, very common pattern where we get back a result, and if it's the OK variant, we just want the thing inside of OK, and if it's an error variant, we want to return back from the function with that error. This is so common that after a while in Rust, they came up with a specific syntax just for this pattern to unwrap the value if it's, if it's OK and return the error if it's not, and it's this right here the question mark at the end. So all that code is equivalent to this right here. And if you're a Rust programmer, this becomes very, very, very easy to see when you're reading the code. You just know, OK, read to string fails. And if there's an error, it will return the error back out. It's very, very short, very elegant. Um, and of course, 
and impossible to mess up because if you do mess it up somehow the um, the compiler will complain at you all right so we have our contents here as a string because if it was okay we got okay we unpacked the the, the string inside of okay and packed it in here into the contents binding here so this is all well and good um, somebody in chat is saying the compiler is your friend that is absolutely true. A lot of people talk about fighting with the compiler when they're starting out with learning Rust. Um, the sooner you can uh, rephrase or look at it differently in your mind to know that the compiler is your friend, to where the compiler actually wants you to write correct programs, the better you're going to, to handle the struggles that you will have at the beginning with Rust. Uh, the, the great thing about Rust is when it compiles, a lot of times the program works much, much, much more often than in other languages. I almost never use a debugger in Rust because um, if I have an error, it's usually quite easy to find with some print line debugging real quick, just thrown in there. It's usually some logic error. Um, I have used a debugger in Rust before for unsafe code, which we won't talk about today. That's if you really need to do um, strange and funny things uh, in Rust. Um, and then all the, all the wonderful safety checks um, that you have in, uh, in safe rust are no longer there. Are, they are still there, but there are things you can do that you can't do in safe rust. And sometimes that, that does mean you have to use a, uh, a debugger, but f in normal rust, I almost never use a debugger because of this property. Um, there's a real quick, uh, question about R rust versus go. Um, my cop out answer to that real quick is learn both because learning more languages uh, is awesome and Go is a great, uh, a great tool for many things. So learn, learn Go and Rust. Um, the, the more uh, specific answer to that is um, if you are looking to do uh, cloud-based tooling around Docker or Kubernetes or something like that, then oh wow, Go is a great tool for that. Although Rust is, is gaining some steam there. So, so if that's really your, your jam, then go for Go. Um, if you're more interested in low-level programming where you want to get close to the machine, um, maybe doing some IoT and embedded programming or learn how uh, operating systems work or something like that, then Rust uh, is a great tool for that. So they both have pros and cons. They're both used um, for, for different things. Um, learn both. Um, uh, there's a question about when I say we won't talk about this today, um, is, there, is there a series for Rust? Um, so there will be multiple uh, streams. I'm going to be on tomorrow um, uh, around the same time uh, talking about the borrow checker um, in Rust. And we're going to learn, we're going to peek a little bit more into the borrow checker because that's typically the thing that people struggle with the most when learning Rust. Later on in the week, there's other series um, around Rust. They will be a little bit more... Uh, a little bit more talking, a little bit less coding, a little bit more about pros and cons of Rust, why we're interested at Rust at, at Microsoft. So if you want to get a good feel for what Rust is good for and stuff like that and, and why Rust is such an interesting language, tune into those. Um, I have my own stream uh, streaming channel that we'll talk about later, uh, twitch.tv slash Ryan Levick, R-Y-A-N-L-E-V-I-C-K. Um, you, can, you can catch me there. Um, and I, I stream about Rust uh, all the time. So if this is interesting to you and there's uh, and you would like to um, to see more of this, I'd be happy to continue this series on my own channel um, after we have returned the uh, the Microsoft Developer Channel back to uh, other other tools and other people who want to talk about other things. Um, uh, as far as um, the question mark here, this is this is pure syntax, so it's not really a macro. It's just a part of the language. It's been built in to to the language. Um, it's just another piece of syntax. Um, there, it's a little bit more uh, flexible than I hinted at. Um, that it it don't doesn't only work with result types, but um, for for all intents and purposes, right now you can just think of it as handling the pattern that we looked at um, specifically. All right. So we're, we're, we're reaching um, 30 minutes left in our stream here. So I want to make sure that we go ahead and, and continue down the road here and try and get our um, database parsed here. So we have our content string here. This contains the entire contents of the string um, 
uh, of the file as a string here, and we need to be able to to parse that string. Um, and so I think the best thing to do um, is to call contents dot lines. Believe that's what it's called. And what contents dot lines does is give you another iterator um, over the over a string. Um, this time with every line, so every chunk of the the string separated by um, uh, new line characters, um, and it also handles um, uh, carriage returns on Windows and stuff like that. And so, in order to iterate over the lines, we could use a for loop uh, in Rust. So you can do something like for line and for line and contents dot lines, and now inside of our for loop, we have uh, access to um, to the, each line in turn. And so if, uh, let's go ahead and just run print line here. And we'll go ahead and just print out the line. Now, um, this is very helpful and stuff like that. Um, one thing that we could do instead of this is use the dbg debug macro here. And this uh, provides a little bit more information when we're debugging. This is great for debugging, hence the name. Um, and so you can use this instead. And we'll see what the output looks like for that. So you'll notice this is the debug output here. We have line is equal to hello, and then the, uh, the tap character, and then vet here. All right, so this is all looking good. This is exactly what we would expect. So now we want to break up our line into two things separated by um, by a um, tab character. So how do we do that? Well, we can use dot split, and dot split takes in a I believe a character like this, um, and splits it based on on that character. And this again gives you another iterator. So. We'll call this chunks. So this is giving us everything split by um, by a tab character. And of course, if our line has more tab characters in it, we'll have more chunks and stuff like that. So we want a way. Now, there's many ways to handle this. Um, I'm going to go down a route that I actually don't think I would do if I were really writing this code, but I think it's good to, to explore it. We're going to take our chunks separated by um, tab characters, and we're going to store it into a vector. And vectors are just um, linear collections of things like arrays, um, except that they can grow at uh, at runtime. So Rust has arrays, but arrays are always fixed size. And vectors, on the other hand, can grow. So if we want to add elements to them, um, we can do that. So how do we actually collect these items into a vector? How do we put the, the items uh, inside of our iterator into a vector. Well, there's a very convenient function for that called collect. And what collect does is it takes all, it runs through the iterator, getting all of the elements, and then puts it into a collection of your choosing. And this uh, sort of seems like magic. Um, it's really not, but uh, how this actually works is, is, I have a stream on that. This is not really um, uh, the uh, the point of this stream, so we won't really get into it, but we're going to collect our strings into a vector like this. Again, when we call split, we're getting an iterator of each element um, in the in the line separated by a tab character, and collect then collects all of those um, elements and puts it into a vector for us. Okay, now this will not compile, um, and the reason for that is because it's saying, I don't know how to build a vector of strings from an iterator of ampersand stir. What the heck is this? So I said that split actually is an iterator over uh, iterator over our line that yields us strings, but that's not really true. And this is where we first start seeing that Rust is a low level programming language because Rust has many types of string types. And that's because strings are very complicated and most languages just say, well, we'll hide all that complexity in our standard library and try and expose to, a, to the end user um, a nice 
um, simple API, which is great for those languages. That's th that's really the perfect choice for them. For Rust, as a systems programming language, a low-level programming language, that is not something that I can afford to do. The complexity of strings must be exposed to the end user so that the end user has control over that complexity and can make decisions that work best for them. That's because we need to be able to build any kind of software like operating systems where you have every last control over what the machine is actually doing. So um, what is this ampersand stir type? Um, and in fact, let me go ahead and write it. This is actually the correct return type here ampersand stir. What that is, is the capital S string type is what's known as an owned string. This gets into the ownership system of Rust, which we're going to talk a lot about in tomorrow when we talk about um, the, uh, the borrow checker and things like that. But own strings are when, what that means is when the string is no longer in scope, it gets destroyed. It gets um, effectively garbage collected, but this garbage collection doesn't happen at runtime. It's all um, at compile time that these that this is decided. So at the end of the scope, when a string, capital S string, goes out of scope, it will uh, be destroyed. And for strings, what does destruction mean? It means that we'll call free on the, the, the string data that lives in the heap. Um, so again, Rust low-level language, you have to care about the stack versus the heap um, and things like that. Strings live on the heap, capital S strings live on the heap, and when they go out of scope, their destructor gets called and the destructor frees the memory that lives on the heap. Um, there's a question of can you free manually? Uh, you can call drop, the drop function, uh, which yeah calls the destructor um, early. Now we're gonna tomorrow come back. Come back tomorrow. We'll talk about how um, if you try to to call drop on a value twice in a row, it will not compile. Um, so there is no use after free or anything like that. And we'll talk about the borrow checker tomorrow that makes sure that um, we don't um, mess up uh, uh, the this this manual memory management. And that's really the promise of Rust. Rust is a manually memory managed language just like C and C++, except the compiler has all these smarts built in to it, to where if you are using Rust, you cannot uh, make a mistake and mess up your memory management. Um, it is possible to leak some memory. You might, uh, it is technically possible, although quite difficult to um, not free up your memory when you should, but you will never, ever, ever in safe Rust be able to uh, call free twice on a particular value um, or use a value after it's been called uh, after free has been called um, and, and in fact uh, darkwater in chat is saying you pretty much never have to to call free manually that's true you basically almost never ever have to manually call free because rust t uh, has the raii pattern built into it if you're from c++ you know what this is um, where um, when values are no longer in scope, their destructors are run. Um, and C++ has this kind of attached to it in the language. This is fundamental and baked into to Rust as a, as a programming language. I'm going to turn on my light real quick. Ta-da! I'm over here in Europe, so it's a little bit late. Uh, the sun is going down. Uh, so hello to everybody else in Europe and to everybody who's not in Europe. I hope you're enjoying your day. Um, all right. So capital S strings, they're heap allocated. Uh, when they go out of scope, they'll be destroyed. Their memory will be freed. What is this ampersand stir here? This is the first time we're looking at a borrowed value. This is a value that when it goes out of scope, it will not be destroyed. So ampersand stir here is simply what's called a string slice. And what a string slice is, it's a view into string data that lives somewhere else. And when we no longer use that, that uh, string view anymore, it doesn't mean that the string data will be freed. It just means we don't use it anymore. So ampersand string here is simply a view into other string data. Now, why do we have that? Let's think about this. Um, and in fact, uh, what type is line? Um, and a, a great um, tool for figuring out what type something is when you're uh, 
when your code completion isn't working like mine is right now, um, we can just say foo is going to be equal to line. Foo is equal to line here, and we're saying, hey, the type has to be unit, which it's not unit, but the compiler then will tell us what type it is, saying, hey, I expected this to be unit, but it's actually an ampersand stir. So line here is itself an ampersand stir. That means line here is ampersand stir. It means all of these uh, these chunks inside of our vector here are ampersand stirs. Why is that? Contents itself is a string, capital S string. That means when contents goes out of scope, its memory will be freed. But when we look at each line and each chunk in the line, we're actually looking at the string data that is on the heap and owned by this string variable here. If this weren't the case, what we would have to do is every time we get, we get another line, we'd have to allocate memory on the heap and uh, copy the, the, the um, memory from our content string over to our line string. But with ampersand stir, it's simply a pointer saying, hey, the, the line data exists here. It starts here, it's this long. Um, and for, for line.split, it's saying, hey, all of the chunks here, um, this is where they live on the heap, and this is how long they are. And that's all that it is. So we don't have to allocate extra memory. And this is very important for Rust. It means that we know exactly when we're allocating memory it doesn't, uh, um, and means that we um, we can have control of, over when memory gets allocated. Unlike in a garbage collected language, which for a very good reason, um, garbage collected language will simply um, would would simply copy that data for us because it's much more it's much simpler. But we're in a systems programming language here. We we can't afford um, that level of simplicity because we have to have full control here. Um, all right, so I hope uh, this uh, answer is, is starting to become a little bit clear about what's going on here. So there's a question of how come our hash map isn't ampersand stir, ampersand, uh, hash map ampersand stir, ampersand stir, instead of hash map capital S string, capital S string. Um, we could change that, but that makes our, our, uh, our program much more complicated. Um, and we'll talk a lot about this tomorrow in our, our overview of the um, of the borrow checker, um, we're, we're instead saying here that the string data is owned by our database struct here. And that means that as long as our database struct is, is still around, the string data is still going to be around as well. We're tying these two values together and on, these strings will only be freed. Their, their memory in the heap will only be freed when database itself is freed, uh, is is destroyed. And again, tomorrow is really the day that we hone in on this. So just, just giving you like a little bit of a sense of, of what this is like in, inside of Rust. If, you, you, if you've not done Rust before, you more than likely are only have the vaguest idea of what I'm talking about right now. That's fine. That's totally cool. Come tomorrow. We'll learn more about it. We'll get an even better feel for it tomorrow. This is the promise of Rust and also the thing that people struggle with the most. Um, so come come back tomorrow. All right, uh, we got about ten minutes left, so I really want to 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 get through this here. We've got our 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 chunks here. Um, now let's say our line in our database file had like ten tabs in it. Um, it would obviously be a malformed uh, database file, but we need to handle that case, right? So we need to say like how many chunks are there? If there if the chunks length, if the number of chunks that there are. Um, is not equal to two, then um, we need to like uh, return an error. And I, for now, I'm going to use this to do macro, which is very helpful. Um, that allows me to to specify to dos that I have in my code. Um, if we run the code and reach this point, the the program will crash. Um, but it's a very simple way to instead of using comments and stuff like that, like you would in in many other languages like this. Um, you can just use this to do macro um, and it's uh, machine readable, machine searchable um, and say, you know, return error. So that's on our to do list now. And there are tools that parse this and, and provide to dos uh, that your code base has. 
Um, so if our if we have if we don't have exactly two chunks, then return an error. Um, otherwise, um, our key is going to be the first chunk, and our value is going to be the second chunk, just like this. Now we want to take the key and the value and we want to store them into our hash map. So that requires us to bring this hash map up here, initialize it at the top. So we'll say inner. Now we're going to be mutating this hash map as we go along, right? We're going to be adding values to it. We're going to be mutating it. And remember, in Rust, we have to be explicit about that. So now we have our hash map here and we want to insert the key and the value into our hash map. So we call inner.insert with the key and the value. And this will not compile. And the reason for that um, is because, and in fact, this is very interesting for how Rust is inferring types. We, we, it says here that, hey, this inner value, I expected it to be a hash map of string capital S strings, but you're providing me a hash map of ampersand stirs here. And indeed, that's exactly what we're doing. We key and value here are ampersand stirs. They're views into our contents string here. But as we said before, we'd like for our hash map to actually have capital S strings for reasons that we'll talk about tomorrow. Um, capital S strings are very good um, for, for our use case. We don't want to um, uh, to store views into this string here because, and this is the real reason, at the end of our new function here, contents goes out of scope and it will be freed. So we can't have views into our contents thing that outlive this function because at the end of this function, the content string will be freed and we would have dangling pointers. And Rust doesn't allow us to have dangling pointers. We don't have to worry about making that mistake because even if we tried to make it, which we'll, we'll try that tomorrow, um, Rust will complain at us and say, hey, you can't do that. So instead, we'd like to convert our, our string views, our ampersand stirs, into capital S strings, owned strings. How do we do that? Well, I think my favorite uh, way to do that is to say to owned. This takes ampersand stirs and takes really any borrowed value, any value where we don't own the value and it turns it into the owned version of it. And again, we're, we only have a vague understanding of what ownership is, but capital S strings are owned strings and ampersand stirs are borrowed strings. And so we're going from a borrowed string to an owned string by calling to owned here. And going from a borrowed string to a, uh, an own string necessitates that we allocate memory. So we can tell from this call here, it's very plain. Any, any Rust programmer will be able to come in and say, we are allocating memory right here. We know exactly where we're doing it. We know exactly where our memory will be freed. This content string will be freed right here. We're allocating memory right here. And we know when, uh, those strings will be freed. That's when our database gets freed at this line. So this is exactly how Rust gets away with its um, with the 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 fact that we don't have to call free manually. Um, it is very easy to statically know when when values will be freed. And so we just pointed out, okay, the value will be freed here, this value will be freed down here. The compiler obviously knows that as well, and it inserts calls. Um, automatically for you to call free or to call the destructor for that value um, on your behalf. All right. And if I'm not mistaken, um, and I forgot to save here, this should compile. Oh, and we still have our weird foo thing up here just to see what our type was. This needs to, to go away. This should compile. There we go. So we have a way now of uh, reading our database kv.db file and storing it in our database file. Now we're running out of time and I wanna leave some time for questions. So we're, we're not gonna get any further than this. Um, we still up at the top here are simply ignoring our database and writing 
um, the contents to our kv.db file. So we still have the bug that we had before, but um, as an exercise to the reader, read a little bit about uh, methods in Rust and how we can create a um, uh, simply an insert method that inserts these key and values up here into the database. And then maybe you have something like a, um, uh, a flush or a, a write method that takes the contents of the hash map and converts them into the proper format and writes it back out to disk. Um, and, and if you do that, then you have a simple um, key and value uh, database thing here. Unfortunately, we don't have a ton more time, so I'm going to leave um, the exercise there and, and answer any remaining questions that you have um, for the, th the next five minutes. But I hope um, that even though you may not understand every single line that you have here, you have a good idea of what Rust is all uh, about. So first question here, method is different than a function. A method is simply a function that takes um, the the receiver, the, the, the struct that you're calling the method on as its first argument. And so real quick, what that syntax looks like is, you know, function my method here, its first argument is going to be self or self like this. And self here refers to the database. And we can call my method up up here like this db my method so methods at the end of the day are basically um basically just like functions except that they have a little bit of a different syntax and their first argument is always uh self is always the struct that you're calling the method on um real quick i'm going to remind you of uh of my um, weekly stream here. So let's go ahead and here's the information here. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Ryan underscore Levick. I tweet uh, a lot about Rust. Um, and uh, you can find me on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Ryan Levick. Um, that is where I uh, stream about Rust um, usually every week or every other week. Um, and I have not done a beginner series. So if you're interested in learning more, and continuing this um, series on my stream over there, um, then definitely check me out, give me a follow, um, and let me know what you thought here. Feedback is always welcome. Um, and of course, uh, come back tomorrow, uh, same time um, at uh, 9 a.m. Pacific time, um, 6 p.m. Uh, European time, uh, and we will continue to talk uh, about Rust, but through the perspective of the borrow checker and how to manage memory. Uh, so check that out. All right, we have a few more minutes um, for, for some questions just to, to finish it up. Um, so is Rust used a lot inside of Microsoft? Um, I would not say that Rust is used a lot inside of Microsoft, but the usage of Rust is definitely growing. It's a very interesting language. Um, we are very interested at Microsoft and Rust for its safety properties um, because we have found that um, even very, very experienced C and C++ developers continually make uh, mistakes around memory management, and those mistakes cause a lot of security vulnerabilities. Uh, and um, if you use safe Rust, those mistakes are impossible to make. Uh, the, the compiler will just simply not allow you to uh, compile a program with those types of mistakes in it. And so there is um, an effort inside of Microsoft to um, com convert especially security uh, critical software over to Rust um, away from C and C++. Um, and so we have an effort ongoing to, to do that. So I imagine Rust usage in Microsoft will grow um, considerably in the next few years. But stay tuned. We'll, we'll be blogging more about that um, in the future. Um, all right. So what about ch child, parent child relationship between string and ampersand stir? Um, that is, uh, so the question is if you have a, a capital S string and an ampersand stir and the ampersand stir is pointing into the capital S string, it's taking a view into the capital S string. How does it know when the uh, capital S string will be destroyed and the ampersand stir is no longer usable? That is the borrow checker. You basically, that's exactly what the borrow checker does, and we'll be talking about that tomorrow.
exactly how that works. Um, the question of what do I specifically do uh, with Rust inside of Microsoft? Um, I specifically am a developer advocate in charge uh, of Rust, so I engage with the community. I do streams like this. Um, I help internal teams uh, adopt Rust, learn more about the Rust, be a liaison between the Rust community um, and Microsoft. Um, and so anything and everything Microsoft and Rust related, I'm, I usually have uh, my hands in it, whether people like it or not. And um, that's, uh, that's my job. So, um, so I want to I want to leave uh, everybody with um, a, a few words about continuing your journey. Of course, I said you can follow me. Um, we'll be back here tomorrow uh, for. Um, uh, oh, and in fact, we're doing the stream today at 4 p.m. Pacific. OK, so that's today, uh, the next stream, um, 4 p.m. Uh, specific Pacific, sorry, uh, on like an interview about uh, the Rust language, Microsoft uh, and Rust. So definitely tune into that. That should be that should be really great. Um, and uh, really, when you're continuing your journey uh, with Rust, know that um, while it can be difficult at the beginning to learn the language, there is a steep learning curve. Um, at the end of the day, the language is quite, uh, quite self-contained. And once you get over that initial hump, um, it's, it's quite easy to be very, very productive in Rust um, and to not have to worry about a whole slew of problems that you have to worry about in other languages, not only C and C++, but even in high level languages like Java and C++ and, and Swift and whatever. Um, there are constructs in Rust that prevent you from making common programming errors that are, are very common even in garbage collecting languages. Um, and so when you're learning it, know that it is it is tough to begin with, but once you get through that, um, it is real pleasure of a language to use. It's a lot of fun. I enjoy it quite a bit. And if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, and with that being said, I want to thank you all. It's been a pleasure. Um, I hope to see you all uh, tomorrow. I won't be here tonight uh, for, for the stream um, at 4 p.m. Pacific, but I hope you are. I'll be in bed. Um, but I hope you enjoy it, um, and we'll be back tomorrow, and I can answer any remaining questions you might have. So everybody, enjoy your uh, day or your evening or your night, and uh, hope to see you around in a future stream somewhere out there in the ether. Have a good day.